You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, this morning we're going to be looking at the gospel lesson which you had just previously heard read. And of course it is a gospel lesson that is one of the most well known that is out there. It is one about the five loaves and the two fish. It is the one where we see Jesus do a miraculous thing. It is one in which we hear about and, and even unbelievers out there know this story. But the thing about it is, though, is, is that sometimes what we want to do is we want to limit this story. Really, uh, it, it, and it's not wrong to preach on this, but many times the way that this parable, well, it's not a parable, but this, this Bible truth is brought to us is in a way that talks about God's abundance. And the truth is, is that God does give abundantly. And there is no end or limit to God's abundance. But the problem is, is that this text really goes beyond that. It really goes beyond what God's abundance is about. We all know how abundantly he blesses us as... That's right, as children of God, we know his blessings in our lives. We know how he brings things to us. We know how he does it. Even more than that, we know how the blessing is that we receive from both the, wa both the waters of holy baptism and both the holy supper. But the thing about it is, though, is so many times what we do is we limit this. You know, it is the story where here was Jesus. He had just heard that John the Baptist had been killed by Herod. And he wanted to go to a desolate place, a place for him to be able to be in prayer, a place for him to, to, to think about and to really, in a way, mourn the loss of someone that was very important to the kingdom. But yet, even in a desolate place, people sought out Jesus. They sought him out to hear his words, to bring to them healing to those of their family that were sick. And so you could imagine, it was hard for him to get away. But when Jesus saw the crowds, what did he do? He had compassion upon them. And it was out of that heart of compassion that he continued to do his ministry in the way that he always had done it. There in that place, Starting off probably early in the morning, he healed the sick. He spoke words of salvation. He brought meaning to the life of those people that were there. And you know, it's one of those things where before you knew it, evening was coming. Evening was upon them and you know, these people hadn't eaten yet. And so what's the disciples do? They do the same things that probably we would have done. We would have looked out there and saw, oh, look, what a crowd that has come here. We don't have any way to feed these people. Jesus, you better send them home so that they can get something to eat. Uh, it kind of sounds a little bit like some of our funerals here. Doesn't it? <laughs> the ladies know what we're talking about. You know, many times what happens is we'll have a funeral here and, and, and they'll tell us that there may be 75 people and the, and the caterer comes and brings food for 75 people. But what ends up happening is there's almost 100 or, or even more. And so the ladies are frantically standing back there and they're saying, we don't have enough food. How are we ever going to feed this crowd? Oh my gosh, pastor, what are we going to do? The thing about it is, though, is next time that happens, think about this, this text. Because the, the problem is, is that the answer, I shouldn't say the problem is, but the answer to this question lies in this text. You see, the disciples had the same problem. And what did Jesus do? Jesus turned to them and said, Guys, feed them. Feed them. You see, what we have to do is remember that sometimes what we like to do is we like to limit Jesus, don't we? 
We put limits on Jesus. There's only certain things that He can do, right? But what is up happening? See, because really, in fact, it was one of those things as I was preparing for this, this sermon. I was reading it in one of the comment, commentators that, that talks about this, this, this particular text was saying, well, it really wasn't Jesus that did anything. It really wasn't Jesus that fed the 5,000. It was actually the disciples. And in a way, that's kind of right. Because what Jesus did, he didn't go out and start serving. What he did is he told them what to do. He told them to take the bread and break it up and start to hand it out. And so they went and they took the food out. You see, what we learn from this is, is where does the answer lie? It lies in Jesus Christ, doesn't it? It lies in Jesus. And you see, that's what Jesus wanted these disciples to know. That's what he wanted them to figure out, is to realize that the answer to everything in life, everything in this world, falls in Jesus Christ. It's kind of like that Sunday school answer, isn't it? When you ask, when you ask Sunday school what, what's always the answer? Jesus. Well, for our life, the, every answer in our life really comes down to Jesus, doesn't it? Trusting in His power to work in our lives. But the problem is, is that we want to limit it. In fact, the, promise, the problem is, is that what Satan wants us to do is limit the power of Jesus Christ. He wants us to limit it. In fact, it is one of those things that sometimes we fall prey to that. I've talked about it before and I'll talk about it again. Especially for our new friends that are here, how many of you guys like to worry? Come on, I need to see more hands than that. I know more of it. How many of you are professionals at it? You see that that's the thing about it is, is that when we, when we worry about things, what we do is we, we're not trusting God in all things. The first commandment tells us to love God above all things, which means that we need to fear, love, and trust in Him above all things. But oftentimes, we think that God's not powerful enough. We don't trust God enough to be able to handle these problems, whether, it's, whether we think that the problem's too big for God or whether we think that the problem is too little for God to work on. You see, sometimes we limit Him that way. We've got to realize, just like I said last week, and use Larry as the example, God knows every hair that's on the bottom of his head. He knows the same thing about each one of us. And you know, the thing about it is, though, is that the reason that he knows that, the reason is, is because he cares for us so much. He has compassion for us. He loves us so much. We saw that in, in, in what we said earlier in our confessions, wasn't it? The love of God is so, the love of Jesus Christ is so deep for us. If you don't believe that, then why did he go to the cross? Why did Jesus die for your sins? Yeah, Jack, yours. Why did he die for your sins if they're not important? I saw some hands back over here. These three ladies back here. They're professionals at worrying, right? But then ask yourself, why did Jesus die for your sins if he didn't care? Think about it. If we don't care about things, if we don't care about things, we don't take the time to, to even bother with it, do we? But that should show us the power of Jesus and the love of Jesus is that, that He took the time and He knows everything about you. He knows more about you than you know. So why do we limit the power of Jesus? You see, that's really what this miracle was about, was to show the disciples how powerful Jesus was. And how He is the Creator of all things. There's no limit to Him. There's no limit to His power. There's no limit to the things that He can do in your life. 
So why is it that when we have financial difficulties that we limit Him by not going to Him with, with prayer? Why is it that we limit Him by not placing it to Him? Isn't His promise this? All things work for the good of those who love Him. Why is it that when we get sick or we even face death, why is it that we have fear? You see, fear is a, a tool of the devil. Fear is a tool of Satan. Because what it does is, it, is it's the tool that he uses to try to make us limit God's power. You see, the reality of it is, is that God is the answer for everything. And God has done something that no one else in this world, in this universe, has ever done and ever will do. He took care of the biggest illness. He, he healed the biggest illness we all have. And that's sin. He did it by going to the cross. And He reminds us of that. And He shows us His power every time we go up to the table and we stand here before this table and receive His very body and blood. How does it happen? I don't know. Our Lutheran Confessions can't say how it happens. We try to explain it. But all we know is, is that when we receive that bread and wine, God's body is in, with, and under it, and it's there to remind us and, and it's to bring forgiveness to us. That's the power of Jesus. The power to defeat death. The power to give us everlasting life. You see, despite how good our doctors are, none of them can bring life. Sure, they can give you a few pills that might prolong things. Sure, they can do a few operations that can make you live a little longer on this earth. But there is no doctor, no doctor that has ever been able to stop death from happening. But the power of Jesus has and does. You see, that's why we can have joy in our lives that even when we face death, just as Paul tells us, is, is that even though we die, yet we still live. Death is just simply a doorway for us. A doorway to Jesus Christ. And that's why we, as God's people, as can have joy in our lives. We have purpose. We have reason to be here. And that reason is to, to, to proclaim Jesus Christ. But you know, that's the human nature is, is to try to limit Him, right? Even in, even in things like this. Think of it. They had five loaves and two fish. Yet when, they, when, when Jesus sent out the disciples to pull up the scraps, there were 12 baskets full. What about here? What about these empty seats? Do we limit God's power by saying, oh, I'm not going to talk to that other person about Jesus Christ, or they're not going to come to church? Do we limit the power of God's Word when we look the other way and don't proclaim His love? Because the reality of it is, is that in faith, things can happen. In fact, we hear the Scriptures tell us that it's faith of a mustard seed that can cause a mountain to uproot itself and take itself and cast itself into the sea. If we just simply put our trust in Jesus Christ, if we proclaim His message and we find every opportunity to tell of His love, do you think Jesus Christ could fill this place? In fact, it could be filled this place so much that we would have standing room only out there. You see, that's the reality of it, is we have a world out there that doesn't know of Jesus' love. We have a world out there that doesn't know of His power. We have a world out there that is dying. All we have to do is stop limiting the power of Jesus' name. If we had the right attitude, and we went out in faith, and we went out and we proclaimed every chance we, can, we had, do you think that these pews could be filled again? 
I hear even in the church people saying, Oh, it's the time. We'll never see our churches full again. We'll never do that. Well, aren't they doing the same things that the disciples did? Aren't they doing the same thing, limiting the power of Jesus? You see, the reality of it is, is we've got to stop acting like victims out there because we're not victims. We are victors in Christ. We are victors in Christ Jesus. That's what He makes us. In fact, St. Paul tells us that His power is so great that neither height nor depth, nor power, nor principality, nor force, nor anything, not anything in this universe can separate us from the love of God, that can separate us from His power, that can cause us to do it. And so what it means is, is that as, that we are victors in Jesus Christ. As, that we know God's power. And as, we live within His love. And so think about this. The next time you hear this, this, this Bible truth, the next time you find yourself at a funeral and not having enough food, remember that the, uh, the answer is always in the power of Jesus' name. All hell, the power of Jesus' name, for that's where it's at. And that's where we live at. Think about that. So the next time you have opportunity to speak of Jesus Christ, tell of Jesus Christ. The next time a problem comes in your life, take it to Jesus Christ in prayer. And the next time, next time, no matter what, the answer to the question is always, that was not good. <laughs> Try that one again. The answer is always, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh,